It's Saturday evening. It's time to talk about the very best comic books that you could read this very week with my good friend Drew from Comic Sleet. How you doing, Drew? It is a great Saturday, great weather. It's a, college football is kicking off today. I'm writing, I'm editing, but I make time to talk about great comics. So let's talk about all the great comics this week. Well, if we're going to talk about great comic books this week, there is no other place to start than Big Game, number two, Image Comics, Mark Miller, Pepe the Raz. This is the comic book event of the summer. Forget about Night Terrors. Forget about Spider-Man Gang War. Screw all that crap. You need to be reading Big Game. We get the Chrononauts in here. Apparently, since 1986, we had superheroes before then. Now the supervillains are controlling the world. People are wondering, is this even true? Let's send the Chrononauts back in time and investigate whether or not this is in fact the case. And it turns out there are consequences for your actions, Drew. And the best way that I can describe this comic book, besides looking brilliant and being just a really fun read, is shit hits the fan when they come back. Yes, uh, I would say this whole comic, I would sum it up as like a one massive bloodbath, this whole comic. But uh, I love this from the, from Jump Street. Like yeah, like you said, the Chrononauts were, introduced, were reintroduced to them, or as Richard Meyer calls them, the Time Bros. Uh, they take Prodigy and a mysterious woman were introduced to from issue one of Big Game to verify that superhumans did exist. They go back to 1985, they get their answer, they come back, and uh, it's not pretty for them. And uh, it's even more hysterical as well when we get to the uh, to the ambassadors and the ambassador of, of Australia. So the conversation that takes place between him and the other ambassadors, none of the hacks at Marvel or DC would write this conversation today. None of them. And I mean, none of them have the balls, the talent or the sense of humor to write it because it is hysterical. It, we get uh, more characters from the Millerverse. And in the end, we get an even bigger bloodbath at the end, the certain white clad character. Uh, this is a, every single positive word you can describe a comic book right now. A, 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 even though Mark Miller has a, has a pattern to his storytelling, I'm having a blast on this wild ride. Uh, if you're not reading this, fix yourself now, guys. Big Game is the event of the year. And if you're attached to, to Miller World and some of his past creations, I'm sorry because uh, <laughs> it's one of those weeks. It's a bloodbath. That's all I got to say. <laughs> That was absolutely fantastic. The next one we're going to talk about has very uh, 90s vibes to it. I'm speaking of Battle Chasers, number 12, Image Comics, Joe Mad, Ludo Lulabi. We've got Red Monica on the run trying to find out what's going on. And then we've got Garrison. And something has happened to this man. I'm not really sure what it is. Is he a god? Is he on a higher plane of existence? I'm not really sure. He's something elder than what he was before. And the pacing of this particular comic book is absolutely off the charts. This feels like a 90s comic book in all the best ways because of the amount of action and the insane pace to it. But from somebody that's like 20 or 30 years older and realizes I should probably make this a good story with pretty decent dialogue, too. Yeah, and it, it really is. But I will say with an asterisk that uh, some of the conversations that happen in this, I was kind of lost on because I read Battle Chasers. God knows how many years ago, and they start having conversations again. I'm like, wait a minute. Do, do these people know each other? Do these two, those friends? I completely forgot because there's some conversations in here where it's like if you're very familiar with these characters and their, and their relationships, you'll get it. Whereas me, it's been so long that I completely forgot. So I may have to go back and reread some issues. But like you said, still terrific art, great action, great pacing. Uh, I love what's happened to one of those characters you mentioned earlier. I can't wait to see what happens next. This is a a fantastically fun action packed indie comic and please do check out check it out joe mad is a great is a really good storyteller the one downside we said it before he's not doing the art but the art is good uh, especially yeah, if you it, like yeah. uh, western anime inspired art yeah absolutely yeah it's still good but, it's, but at the same time when you get the name joe it's mad yeah yeah it's not joe mad <laughs> well that's the biggest knock really on the comic book but if you haven't yeah. got back into battle chasers i don't know what you we'll know what you're thinking it's absolutely fantastic now let's get on to something that's actually quite new. The Mighty Barbarians, number five from Ablaze. Michael Morici, Giuseppe Cafaro on this one. But when I say new, I mean it's a new series. But the concept itself is kind of borrowing from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But this time it's it's famous barbarians throughout liter literary history. The big ones being like Morgan Le Fay and Cole in this one. And we've got the, the final orb. I think the third orb has been secured by Morgan, but there's still an enormous army backing Claudia. What are these barbarians going to do? Morgan 
pulls a, a little rabbit out of her head. Let's put it that way. Evens the odds just a little bit so we can have some really good, fun action in this one. And there's a cameo that I think people will get excited about. It's not the one that you think it is, though, but it's a big cameo. Yeah, it's a really big cameo. And yeah, this issue was really, really good. Uh, we get some backstory uh, as well to one of the characters. I really enjoyed it. It takes turns I didn't expect. You know, I, I was expecting some of these female characters who are rivals of one another to start becoming the bestest friends, you know, and to, for Cole to be treated like an idiot. But no, Cole is, a, is feared. He's respected. He's an absolute badass in this. And we get a welcome surprise toward the end with what you said, like a certain character is awesome and uh th- th- yeah damn good art probably the best issue of the series so far michael Ritchie, he he's trying really hard in this issue i gotta commend him on that uh yeah please do check out this issue guys in the marty barbarians it's only gotten better let's take a little bit let's change the gear on this one to something that's a little bit different a little bit more horror based ice cream man number 36 image comics w maxwell prince martin marazzo as soon as you open the story up you're like oh we're going back to uh, Moby Dick, and obviously that one's about a man's obsession with the whale that took his leg. This character is also obsessed by a, about a whale, but the one that actually ate his daughter. And despite knowing that the whale ate his daughter, he's convinced that she's still alive, which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And when he's going around town, people are like, what the hell are you thinking? Have you been smoking the crack, sir? Clearly your daughter was eaten by a whale. She's not alive, but he's obsessed with that. And obviously, we do get a confrontation with the whale. And I don't even know where to, how to describe where it goes from there. That's where I am. My mind was blown reading this because, you know, so, you know, like you said, we have a father, you know, who is a fisherman, lost his daughter to a whale. But, um, yeah, he's had enough. He goes out to sea to rescue her. But, you know, yeah, things aren't as cut and dry as you expect. Yeah, things get dark. They get funny. They get weird and wild. You know, we get characters showing up in here who are – certain characters and and other literary works who have been involved with whales. And it's, it's pretty funny. Their depictions in this, I I got a kick out of it. You know, however, if there's one thing to take away from this, it's that if you have a family, don't let your work consume you because you may regret it when it's too late. You may not be able to say your goodbyes. And what makes this powerful, even more powerful, in my opinion, is that if you follow the writer on Instagram, he's always posting photos of him and his kids you know, spending time with them, playing with them, watching cartoons and everything. It, it's everything that this father should have done, but didn't with his life. And he's living with regret. And um, if you haven't read Ice Cream Man and you're reading Tom King or Amazing Spider-Man, what the hell is wrong with you? Fix yourself. Pick this up. This title is amazing. This is a very, very talented creator, very talented creative team. One of the best books from Image. Please do read Ice Cream Man, guys. Yeah, what the hell is wrong with you if you're eating yeah. Tom King or Spider-Man right now? Although this week Spider-Man wasn't nearly as bad as uh, some of the previous issues. Yeah. But W. Maxwell Prince, borderline genius. If you like the Twilight Zone, this is kind of like that, but perhaps better because comic books is a better storytelling medium, in my opinion. Our last any comic book recommendation of the week, Rogue Son, number 15, Image Comics, Riot Parrot, A. Lord Art. We've been recommending this one basically from the beginning. I'm getting leery. I'm sticking around because I believe in the creative team and what they've done so far. But uh, Caleb controlling Dylan's body, why Dylan and his dad and now his grandfather are stuck in the Sunstone, arguing isn't, in my opinion, the best place to put this comic book series. Also, we have a strange heel turn. Obviously, Caleb isn't the good guy, but now he wants to to rule the world <laughs> while uh, like teaming up with the enemies of Rogue Sub, just like some werewolves or whatever. I don't feel like this was ever like set up or, or like I don't understand the execution at all, but I am going to stick around. But we do have a lot of conflict, not only between Dylan and his father, but between his father and his grandfather, which is actually kind of worse, illustrating that the father has learned over time from what happened with him and his father to be a little bit nicer to Dylan. But even then, it, it kind of sucks or something. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I really enjoyed this. I'm really digging the relationships in this. But like you said, some of them weren't set up. But it's I think that was his intent to surprise us with that. Uh, but I, I went with it. I can go with it. Um, the guy's obsessed with power, clearly. And he's getting greedy. And I, I dig that in this character. Uh, and like you said, the relationships in this, there's going to be some ramifications coming from them. There's like you said, there's a heel turn in here between two of the family family members. It's like what? I didn't see that coming. But yeah, um, it, everything is not going according to plan with a lot of the, with 
with, with a lot of these people. And um, yeah, things have gone from bad to worse by the end of this issue. And yeah, so Ryan Parrott is an incredibly talented writer. From this, Power Rangers, he's amazing. And uh, he's the likes of Mark Miller right now, setting up the best you know, massive title right now at Image. And uh, if, if you, and honestly, if you think the other Radiant books are better, sorry, you're wrong. Uh, those are just lazy Power Ranger knockoffs. Uh, fix yourself, read Rogue Son, the best new teen superhero writer uh, story right now. And um, yeah, I'm, I can't wait for the next issue. I, I'm going with this. I, I really dig it. You're not only wrong, you're damn wrong. That's Ooh, all I can say to it. This is definitely the best of the ultra massive, super massive, massive verse, yeah. whatever they want to call it. <laughs> And you forgot Ryan Parent on TMNT Power Rangers. Yeah, I forgot about that too. Yeah, that was – and Dan Mora on the art with that. Holy crap, that was amazing. Exactly. Now, that's our indie comic book portion. Now it's time to hit the big two, and we might as well call it the big one. We got <laughs> one comic book to recommend this week. Will it be DC? Will it be Marvel? In fact, it will be Marvel. Gene Gray, number one, Louise Simonson, Bernard Chang. I expected this to be one of those throwback issues, miniseries set in 30 years continuity, but it is not that, although it is visiting aspects of that. Jean Grey has died at the Hellfire Gala, and Louise Simonson is returned. Wheezy is back, icon of comic books herself, and is exploring Jean Grey's unconscious mind, thinking about what her life is and what it all means and what it might have been. I personally don't need this series. And I think in lesser hands, I would have laughed at it because it wouldn't have been executed very, very well. But Louise Simonson shows that she still has it and she makes a pretty not great concept for a miniseries itself into something that's pretty interesting. What could have been if she decided to take different uh, directions with her life, a lot of times leading into catastrophe, perhaps this was a destiny all along kind of thing. It looks really good. Bernard Chang is a very good artist. Uh, it's, it's well illustrated. Not exactly exploring something that I think really needed to be explored, but done very well. Yes. So I'm going to get, I'm going to talk about that toward the end of my argument for how great this issue was. I, I this surprised me from, the, from Jump Street. I, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this. And like you said, Wheezy, legend. Uh, so yeah, this takes place. Uh, so yeah, it, it has a couple time. It, time placements for this this comic like i said beginning it ends it begins with gene dying from the hellfire gala but then it takes place after the horrible and irredeemable bendis run on x-men when the original teen x-men are sent back to their original time so gene who who now after manipulating iceman and believing he's gay and has knowledge of the future she begins a royal mental mind of anyone who crosses her and the x-men's paths so much so Everyone she knows, friends, family, hell, Magneto, they tell her, hey, what you're doing is wrong in every possible sense of the word. She knows the future. She's still trying to alter it, it which doesn't go according to plan. But but to me, to me, what truly makes this great, I'm giving Wheezy a lot of rope because she's earned it. It's with the subtext here. So when I say that, I mean, if you've read X-Men currently the past few years and how they're effectively all supervillains now, you could take Jean's actions in this as commentary by Wheezy as to how evil the X-Men truly are. And the people warning Jean of her actions are the current real X-Men fans like us and legendary writers like Wheezy, that, that telling us that the, the, the current mutants are evil. And hey, remember, Xavier did this crap to Reed Richards in the current X-Men run, too. They're evil. Ignore the word. You can't you can't twist that word around with these characters. They're evil. I, I love it and recommend everyone read this. Please do check this out. It's not a high bar to, 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 to hurdle, though, right? <laughs> that is true. It, it's it's not, it's that is it, it's it's true. And it's sad, Wes. It, it, I'm not surprised if Lee Simonson shows up and writes a better comic book than any of them have done the last 24 months. Yeah. And I really hope I'm right with the subtext here. I really do truly hope I am. I'm I think you're reading a little but, too uh, much uh, more into it. But uh, if that's your experience reading yeah. it, I think that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I, I dig it. I, I really love this commentary on here. And You know what I don't dig this week? DC Comics. Normally, we would recommend a comic book here. There's nothing to recommend. It's all Night Terrors, and I thought Night Terrors was over this week, Drew. Turns out, it's not fucking over. Night Terrors, number four, isn't the end. The epilogue is actually the end. Do they know what an epilogue is? That's the question. I tried reading these, and there's nothing enjoyable about them. I'm not having fun. Reading this, when you have an event like this, you should be having fun. There should be an emotional investment into these series to keep coming back. 
you're enjoying it, you're fearful for the characters, you want them to succeed, you want certain villains to fail. Yeah, I feel nothing for anything coming from this event for any of the characters. I am I can I couldn't possibly care less. That does it for this week's best of the week comic book rundown. The best comic books that you could buy, uh, you know, with your hard earned money, and you should you should spend it well. Sorry if there was a little bit of technical difficulty in there. On the other end, on the other side, Drew was having some some connectivity issues. We were having some latency issues. A little bit of intermittent things happening. Hopefully, it didn't ruin the the uh, the recording too much, and we all enjoyed it quite a bit. If you would like some more thinking critical YouTube, talking about comic books, the good, the bad, all the stuff in between, I've actually done like 3,000 videos, and YouTube has decided this is the best video I ever created in the history of my life, in the history of my channel, and I did it just for you. Definitely check it out right now.